things still can change rather quickly, but I feel like more often than not, things move just a little bit slower in a small town. Change happens slowly. And I think that's okay. I think uh, that pace of life is good. Uh, but I think there's something with change in small town, and it's not just small town. Uh, for those of you that kind of grew up here, like, I don't know if you know this, but kind of living where you grew up is not all that common when you think about North America. There's a lot of people that move around a lot more than maybe we do in a small town, especially an uh, agricultural community as well. But living where you grew up, I don't, I don't entirely envy you that, that do that. Uh, out of your, what that looks like for life, or for uh, business, or farming, or whatever it is. That's, that's just the way it is here for, for a number of you. Actually, I'm kind of curious. I don't, yeah, I'd kind of like to see a show of hands. How many of you actually live on the yard that you mostly grew up in as well? Man, that's really something. I love that. Because that's decades and decades and decades and decades and decades and decades on that yard. <laughs> and, and there's a pretty good chance that if you don't live exactly on that yard... Uh, from the farming side, maybe, maybe you live on like your grandparents' yard or an un- aunt or uncle's yard that's kind of connected to the land or the farm in some way there as well. So there ends up being a lot of connection that, that is pretty static sometimes in a small town. I think it's great. You don't have to, I'm not, I'm not mocking you. I, I think it's pretty fantastic. Uh, but one of the things in that as well is that you who have grown up where, or who, where you're living where you grew up, is that there's a very good chance that you are not the same person you were when you were growing up in this community, in that town. Uh, And for some of you, that means uh, a bit of time to let uh, let things change. That's one piece where I I don't envy that, to to live in the town where I grew up, because I I feel like I'm quite a different person than I was in high school, as most of us should be. If any of you peaked in high school, man, I don't know what you did to get there, that you like accomplished so much that you are just reached perfection in high school, and then now you've just carried that on. Good for you. Props to you. But for most of us, there's a lot of growing that happens after high school still. And uh, I didn't always make good choices in high school. I think I did okay. But there are things where it's like, I'd rather not be known as that person. And for those of you now living in this town that you grew up in, it's an uphill battle because those that also live in this town that you grew up with might find it a little more difficult to let you change. Because as God is changing you, transforming you, there's a lot of transformation that can happen in a, a short amount of time, as we talked about last week, but much of transformation takes a lifetime to be sorted out. And so as you're being transformed, others around you might find it difficult to let that transformation take place because they knew you as someone else who you no longer are. And so that's what we're, we're kind of looking at over this uh, series is transformation. And last week talked about how that a lot can happen in a short amount of time, uh, especially when you think of meeting Jesus for the first time, if uh, you had no understanding of who he was in, uh, in the years prior to that, and, and Jesus can transform so much in a person's life in a very short amount of time. But then there's this continual, ongoing transformation that takes a lifetime. And we need to be patient with ourselves in that, allow ourselves to change over time, and, and celebrate where you are, because you're becoming who you will be. And so you're in that process right now of becoming who you will be, And for those that are Jesus followers, who you will become is Jesus, and you're not there yet. But it's okay to celebrate where you are right now, knowing that you're in process. It's good. It's part of the process to get to who you're going to become. So you are becoming that person, that Jesus. And uh, it might take a little bit of time for others to let you become that person. But it's okay. Prove them wrong as you continue to be changed from the inside out, but also from the outside in. And that's where we're going to turn to today, uh, is to answer that question a little bit more when we look at transformation of of how and what, as much as we can, because it's not a clear-cut definition to describe exactly how this process happens or exactly what is going on, but I want to bring us to a couple pieces in there. Uh, And and some of this comes from, we're going to end up in Romans, so I'll just kind of like cue you there at some point. Uh, but a couple resources, one, one book that has been an author that's been influential in some of my thinking with this, and so I'm going to highlight a, a couple things out of his uh, book. And then also we have this book at the library, so if anybody wants to grab it later on, that's available to you as well. 
But it's this idea of transformation. So this is kind of the two things we need to, we need to wrestle with uh, to see how they interact with one another, is that transformation happens on the inside. We know this to be true, uh, that Jesus affects what is on the inside. He, under, he affects our, uh, our belief systems, our understanding, the forgiveness of not carrying condemnation of sin. Jesus does this for us. And this is, in, this is internal. And that internal transformation will eventually then reflect in our external behaviors. So this, I believe to be true, that internal transformation affects our external behaviors. That's what transformation looks like over time. But it's not just that one piece by itself. It's not camped on just internal, uh, internal and separating that from the external. There's a little more going on of what makes us up as humans that we can't always separate out as tidily. And we, we really like to. We like to kind of separate out, uh, and this was done especially in, uh, in aspect to Jesus a lot as well, where we try to separate out like body and flesh. Uh, we try to separate out maybe soul, spirit, maybe thinking, some of those things. We try to separate these are different aspects of us. There are different aspects we can use to describe us, but all of that is mashed together as person. And that is true of Jesus as well. And, and there was a lot of, uh, it's been centuries of church wrestling with who was Jesus and what was he like. And there were those pieces where we're like, well, there, he wasn't actually human. He wasn't actually flesh, soul, spirit, mind, body, all mashed together. We can kind of separate some of those things out where he was still like, he was still fully God, so he couldn't have been fully human. Or the other side of he was way too human, so the God part wasn't as present, but all of it mashed together instead of separating these things out, which is kind of our, uh, our tendency, I think, on the way we've been raised up in North America as well, too. We want to separate those out. We don't want to wrestle and hold that tension of uh, these things kind of existing together and uh, not being able to name them succinctly and draw the boundaries exactly where we want. Not quite so simple. So some of these topics, as I've kind of read a little bit and, and been studying, you end up reading smart people who write smart things. And man, that gets challenging sometimes. I don't know what uh, the experience for you of, of university or high school, when a teacher just, they're saying words, but man, oh man, I don't have a clue what they're trying to tell me. Or you end up in a study where you've read a book or you're, you're doing a study together and people are like contributing to the conversation and you're just like, I got nothing to add to this one. I don't have a clue what these people are talking about. That's what I felt a little bit this week with some of these uh, things I've been reading. You get smart people writing about smart stuff, and then you have, unfortunately, just me in the middle to try and interpret and help us uh, understand it. So uh, I'll see what I can do in the midst of this conversation with us. But one of these things, because I'm going to quote a few things along the way, uh, is a, a gentleman who wrote a commentary, which I really appreciate. It's a New Testament Bible background, background commentary. His name's Craig Keener. And in this uh, topic of how things work together, our inner transformation and our outer transformation, this is what he writes when talking about Paul. Because remember, we're going to Romans yet today. Which is, again, Paul. Romans is another smart people writing smart things that we have to try and like wrestle through with and, uh, and navigate through as well too. So Keener writes, Although flesh may be connected with bodily existence, the radical bifurcation, isn't that a good one? He could have said just the separation. The radical bifurcation, which is separating two things, of a human being into a morally upright spiritual part versus an immoral bodily part is a Neoplatonic or Gnostic idea. How do you like that? Neoplatonic is just, it's, it's historic. This is Plato. So new Plato, old, old, old thinking, or a Gnostic idea, which was part of church history uh, in the centuries following Jesus, which had this uh, notion of, of kind of secret knowledge that was required that really leaned on this separation of, uh, of spiritual and body. They separated these things. And so Keener is saying, although that, might be connect that uh, the flesh may be connected with this, a morally upright spiritual part versus an immoral bodily part, not so for Paul. He said it is a Neoplatonic or Gnostic idea foreign to Paul. So Paul, in the time when he's writing Romans, does not have this in mind. Something that's been applied to it later on. So I want us to be able to, as best we can, to be able to put that on the shelf a bit of how we kind of separate some of the internal, external, spirit, flesh, their aspects of what make us to be human, but they are all intermingled together. So they all interplay together in how one affects the other. So Jesus then comes to earth and navigates this absolutely perfectly. He navigates the world of 
doing, being, existing, and thinking as well as he teaches. He navigates the world of what's hidden and unseen in a spiritual world as he engaged with, uh, with, through the Holy Spirit and healing people and through demons that he cast out. Jesus navigated this world as well. And he, he does it by showing example, behavior, as he drew along the disciples with him, and then also through the things that he taught and corrected in the understanding where it was maybe a miss or to establish what was true, uh, and that was entirely missed as well. So Jesus navigates this excellently. And we're going to see that in a little bit as well. So I want to come back then to this one book. This is a, it's a book, it's in our library called You Are What You Love. It's by James K.A. Smith. Uh, he wrote a much more academic version of this, which I had the privilege slash requirement of reading for Bible college. And, uh, and then he wrote this one, which is like way easier to grasp. So I, I do recommend this book to you. It's in our library. If you want to grab it first, I even left a little card in here for you to write your name on because uh, I was just pulling a couple things from it this week. But one of the ideas that this is built on, you are what you love, is that we are not primarily thinking beings. And this goes back to some philosophy with uh, um, some French people as well that, you know, I am... I think, therefore, I am. So that's, uh, did you actually just say who it was from? Did you say Descartes? Okay, I thought I heard you say that. That was amazing. It wouldn't surprise me from you, Ruby. Uh, So this, I think, therefore, I am, which reduces people to just thinking beings, everything coming from thinking. So he pushes back on that to say, no, it's not exactly how we operate. We actually operate a little bit more based on what we love, and our loves are formed by what we worship, and our worship is formed by what we love, and that is built into habit. And so when we can't just carry along our thinking, then habit will shape our things. You are what you love. So the things that you pour into your life, the habits that you build up, the things that you spend your time on over and over again, that shapes your worship and your love, and it's going to shape your thinking as well. So then we need this experience of outer transformation to influence our inner inner transformation so that we can take steps forward. A couple things I want to quote from Smith in here as well is that this is how then Jesus interacts with that. In his words here, Jesus is a teacher who doesn't just form our intellect, but forms our very loves. You read through the Gospels with that in mind, and that's what you're going to see. Jesus is a teacher who doesn't just form our intellect, but forms our very loves. He invited people to follow him, to learn from him, and to walk like him. That's how he drew his disciples along, to show them the way, but also teaching as a record in the Gospels as he taught in, uh, in many different settings. He taught, but he also showed people how to follow him, how to live like him. And then one other line from James Smith as well. Discipleship is a rehabituation of your loves. Isn't that good? Discipleship is a rehabituation of your loves. Discipleship is retraining your habits to the way of Jesus so that your loves, your worship, follows him. This is a key part of discipleship, and it takes a lifetime. This is a key part of transformation. Some of it happens quickly. Some of it takes a lifetime. And we also see that in the life of Jesus because he taught, again, those around him, but he led these disciples all through their blunders as well, too. Through the through James and John, who when, face, when uh, coming to uh, interact with some Samaritans and their dislike for Samaritans would rather like, Jesus, give us the power, the word, whatever it might be, like let's call lightning down and destroy this town. We'll do it for you, Jesus, we will. Just like, whoa, pump the brakes, guys. This is not the way that it is going to be. If you're going to follow me, if you're going to live like me, this is not the way. So he affects their behavior, but also their thinking. You can see it in, in uh, Peter's betrayal as well. Jesus even pre-warns him. This is what's going to happen, Peter. And Peter, in his own habits of wanting to fight, wanting to run away, looking for himself, he cannot get past it. And he does deny Jesus. But Jesus doesn't leave it there comes back to him after Jesus has been crucified and come back to life and says to him, Peter, feed my sheep. And he encourages him in it. And we don't see the exact same failure again. He walked alongside his behavior, but also corrected his thinking as well. This happens more times than just those two throughout the Gospels. It's not so simple as just correcting our thinking. We are not just thinking beings. We are habit-forming, worship, 
and loving beings that need to affect our thinking and our behavior and both of those working together. So Paul's going to help us along the way with this. Uh, I invite you to turn to Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 8, if you were just guessing and I got to Romans, that's where we're going to land, is Romans chapter 8. So again, uh, Romans is not always the most simple book to read of what Paul wrote. He's got a lot of his theology in there. So it it does have this vibe of feeling like smart people writing smart things, and it takes a little bit to dive into. But the beautiful thing of this is that it has, uh, when, when you have something like Romans, it can be big, wide, and deep, that if you take the time, energy, and effort to dive in deep, it's refreshing and cool, and you can swim deep down and find stuff. But if you just want to read through on the surface level, you're still going to find beautiful truth that exists there. So it has the, Romans has the ability to exist in a space of a sip is refreshing and good, and diving in is entirely refreshing and good as well. If cold water isn't your thing, then you can compare it to like having like a cup of tea or coffee, which is hot, and then sitting in a hot tub, which is also good. So you can uh, dive into both ways of those with that uh, water metaphor. Romans 1, uh, Romans chapter 8, and uh, we're going to split this up into a couple of parts, but we're going to start in verse 1 to verse 4. But before we go in there, I never know the order to do this, so this is the order I'm going to do it. I have a, a couple words I want you to catch, to pay attention to, uh, and so I'm going to give you those sort of definitions to look for, and then you'll see them as we read it. I guess the alternative would be I read it and pull them out. This time we're doing it this way. A couple words I want you to pay attention to, and you'll see them as we get to them. So the first of those is uh, the word that's going to get used as flesh. So the, that word isn't flesh. In, in what was written originally. It was written in Greek, not in English. So that word was sarx, which was flesh, which throughout our New Testament gets translated to mean kind of two different things. Either flesh, just like exactly what it is, like Jesus became flesh. Jesus became sarx, took on a flesh body. So our actual like flesh, what we have. Uh, and then the second meaning of it is used almost, I think, equally in uh, split down the middle, is to be this kind of our sinful humanity, our mortal reality, um, perhaps our, our moral inability as well. So, sarks meaning like our actual physical flesh, but the way it's going to get used in Romans here, and it's going to get used over and over. It's about 10 times over these 16 verses, meaning that uh, um, our sinful humanity, our inability to follow the righteous law that God has established, that is flesh. That is sarx. The second one I want you to pay attention to is the word live, and that's going to get used a number of times as well. And live meaning how how we walk, our behavior, our actions. The word in Greek, if you're into the Greek part, would be peripateo. So sarx and peripateo. Those two words in uh, in this first part I want you to pay attention to. Uh, That second one, peripateo, uh, the walk, behavior, our actions, is uh, how you behave. So we have our flesh, our physical uh, inability to do what God requires of us, our moral incapability at times, and then the second part of how we live, how we walk, our behavior and actions, peripateo. Let's read verses 1 to 4, and you're looking for these as we go. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, the sarks, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. See the word again. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live, peripateo, who do not act, behave appropriately, who do not live according to the flesh, the, peripet- the sarx, but according to the spirit. So we have these things playing here, our behavior, the flesh, and now we see introduced in here the spirit, and then one other one that's going to get added in here, another uh, Greek word, uh, phroneo, in verses, uh, verse 5, is our thinking, our, uh, our how, it's, it, that's the internal part, thinking. Verse 5, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on. So that's the thinking part. That's that Greek word in there. It might look a little bit different in your, uh, whatever version of the Bible you're using, but have their minds set on. They're thinking what the flesh desires. Let me start from the beginning of 5 again. Those who live 
according to the flesh, have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So are you seeing this start to come out here? There's, there's four different key words kind of fighting for each other here. We have flesh, and then we have the phreneo, the thinking. So we have the external, and then we have the internal. And then we have the spirit. And now we're going to also see a, uh, a match, <laughs> a fight between spirit and flesh. And this is going to show up in the next, uh, like, 10-ish verses, this back and forth of spirit and flesh. So we're seeing all these intermingle together, spirit and flesh, inner and behavior, outer, like our behavior, our outer, our inner, our thinking, the spirit and the flesh. You see all these working together. And this is what it's going to look like. It's going to look like a matchup as we read from verse 6 going on of the spirit versus the flesh. So it's kind of this, uh, in this corner, we have the flesh, weighing in as this inability to do what God requires of us. And we see, as we're going to see in these verses, the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit. It ends in death. In one corner, we have the flesh. But in the other corner, being the ancient of days, having existed beyond time, we're looking at the Spirit, not having a physical presence, so not weighing in at anything, but having the ability to be the absolute opposite of what was death and an ability to follow the law. We have life everlasting. We have a presence with us. We have the ability to follow Jesus that makes us children of God. So with that matchup in your mind, Let's read forward from verse 6 in Romans chapter 8. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life. Because of righteousness. And in the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. I said that wrong. The spirit, and if if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, your flesh, because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So there's the contest. Spirit versus flesh. And it's played out in the life of the Christian through inner and outer transformation. These two things working together, going round and around, all the while in the battle against the spirit and the flesh. And if that feels like a battle that is, uh, that is yours to win based on your own ability, your own merit, let me encourage you to say that it is not by your own power. It is not by your own ability that you are able to defeat the flesh. Jesus has done that for us once and for all when he died on the cross. He came back to life to give us that life gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we are not in this fight alone. And if it feels like that, you are not in this fight alone. If the Spirit of God is in you, you are a child of God and you are not on your own. So there's this contest going on inside of us as we are transformed day by day, bit by bit. It takes a lifetime. Let me skip down uh, near the end. Actually, two sections. 15 Verse 15, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought you, brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Okay? And then skip down to verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. 
that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. This is the transformation that is taking place in your life if you are a follower of Jesus. Being conformed to the image of Jesus. Isn't that fantastic? It doesn't happen all at once. Some big pieces do happen in an instant. Some other things take a lifetime as transformation slowly works, as God works with us, walks alongside us, as we slowly and consistently become who we will one day be. And who we will one day be is Jesus. How can this be done? Well, this, this round and round. So saying inner and outer battle against flesh, spirit. Some of the ways this, I believe this can be done is to renew your mind. <laughs> uh, we see that in uh, 2 Corinthians, and maybe we'll look at that in another Sunday a little bit more. Uh, actually, no, Romans 12, too. Renew your mind. This is how we go. By renewing our mind, we are transformed into the image of Jesus against what the culture around us would push. Renew your mind and walk by the Spirit. These two things are what we needed. An internal transformation, an, outer turn, an external, an outernal, that's a good one, make that a Greek word, an outernal transformation that uh, also moves us towards Jesus. These two things work together. One feeds the other. We need to commit energy to both, internal and external. We need both. One without the other is broken because if we just have external, if we're just working on our habits, our behaviors, our loves, our worship, but there's no internal transformation, then it has the look of trying to earn our salvation, of trying to do, if I do enough good things, then my internal will be sorted out, and, uh, um, and I'll be good with God, I'll have right standing with God. External by itself is just salvation by works, and it does not work. Uh, if we just work on the internal, then all we do is just collect information, collect information, renew our thinking, think about things all the right way, but if it doesn't affect how we actually live, how we act, has it really affected our thinking if it hasn't affected our behavior? Or it has this look of cheap grace of like, well, I know I've got Jesus so I can do whatever I want anyways. My behavior does not matter. No, we need both and they work together. They continue to uh, stir us up. They continue to us to keep going and growing. They fuel each other to keep growing and growing. It is possible to get stuck, though, not knowing where to start. It's kind of that if something's moving and you're trying to jump onto it, you don't know when you should jump on, how do you jump on. You might jump on, your feet come out underneath you, and then you're lying on your butt, but at least you're on. You can get back up on your feet and try something at that point. And that's my encouragement for us, is to try something. You don't have to have it all figured out. If there's no exact, obvious starting point, then you just got to jump in somewhere, whether it's renewing your thinking or renewing your behavior as well. Just don't get stuck on only doing one. This kind of comes down to, though, is what do you want? Do you want to just think about these things and then go live your life however you would like? Or does it feel better to put as much work and energy you in as you can in, thinking that, well, this will get me somewhere, this will count for something? Or maybe you want none of it, and if you want none of it, then I've got uh, nothing else to really help you with uh, in that regard but if you want this, if you want the full life that Jesus has to offer, it is the narrow way. It does require some boundaries, some limits. It does require us to say no to certain things when we say yes to what Jesus is calling us to do. Or do you rather prefer a life governed by emotion, whim, culture, trend? That is the wide path, and it ends in destruction. And so if you'd rather the first more so than the second, the former rather than the latter, it does require repentance and submission to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is the starting point. That is transformation that can happen in a moment. Uh, but it also might take a little bit of recalibration of your inner self, perhaps some habits that align with the Spirit rather than the flesh. Jump in somewhere. The starting point is where you are. So I have a couple suggestions for you then. If... Uh, if you would like to receive that as something to start with. Something to try this week, perhaps. Uh, if, if following Jesus is a completely foreign thing to you, and you've never, uh, you've never accepted him as Lord, then that would be a great first point. So there is an entry point as well. That is the first place I would start for you, is to accept the Lord Jesus as your Savior. 
Make him the boss. That would be step one. If that's been true of you and, and is true of you, and going forward is what does transformation look like for me, then here's a couple thoughts I have for you otherwise, trying perhaps one of these. Uh, when looking at the inner self, perhaps quiet time with God, prayer with God, asking him, because this is an interesting reflection, asking him, what has he been transforming in you already? Because you are not the same person you once were whether for good or bad, we do change. So what has Jesus been part of in that? What has he been transforming in your own life? And it's worth taking stock of that because when we struggle with habitual things or, uh, or um, characters, character traits that we take a long time to work on, we don't see the progress because it happens so slowly. So take stock of that. Ask God to bring that up for you. How are you different than you once were? And then looking forward, in what ways can I become more like Jesus? That could be an inner exercise of time spent in prayer with God. For an outer exercise, because if inner affects our behavior when we let it, but if outer behavior also forms our passions and loves and worship affecting our inner, we can work on both of these at the same time, and they're going to feed each other as round and round they go. So what about an outer exercise? Pick a habit. Pick a habit and start it. (laughs) Stick with it. Try it out. Uh, Something I'm thinking more specifically as it pertains to the life of faith. Pick a habit such as silence and solitude, time spent with God, set apart, carved out, deliberate and consistent. Because you will not be who you'll become in one day, if you you mess up once in a while, it's okay. (laughs) You're becoming who you will be. It's all right if it takes a little bit of time. Maybe alongside silence and solitude is time spent in prayer or scripture or Bible study, really diving in to a Bible study. We have opportunities for that in our church as well that you can join with. Maybe it's a habit of prayer. Again, dedicated time and space to prayer or fasting. Or maybe it's a dedication to a habit of Sabbath and what that looks like to actually slow down and stop and rest in God, pushing back on the frantic pace that usually is invading most of our lives. Maybe it's a habit of service or witness to those around you. Pick a habit. Try it. See how it forms your inner thinking. As you do these in tandem, they continue to feed each other, and it grows, and it goes, and round and round, as our inner affects our outer, as our outer affects our inner. God is present in it. I want to finish with uh, a paragraph read out of a different book. This is a, uh, a type of biography written about C.S. Lewis. So there's a mixture of words in here, some by the author and some by Lewis, who, again, a smart person writing about smart things, C.S. Lewis, has an incredible ability to make those smart things so palatable, so understandable for us common folk. Uh, so if you're looking for some books in that way, that Mere Christianity is a great place uh, by C.S. Lewis. It's pretty timeless, uh, I believe. And this quote out of here is from Mere Christianity. So this is first the words from the author and then words from Lewis, talking about transformation. He didn't come, talking about Jesus, he didn't come to change us into nice people, but new people. He is the painter and we are the painting. He is the inventor, we are only the invention. He knows what can be and has given his son to make our transformation possible. His goal for us is higher than we can imagine for ourselves. Now quoting Lewis. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. Jesus is on your side. He is part of your transformation. The transformation that is happening inside of you, the transformation that is happening in your behavior and your external self as well. And it's so much grander than you or I can imagine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to this world for us. You loved us so much to send your son for us. Thank you, Jesus, for following faithfully to the death on a cross for our sakes. 
We thank you that you did not stay there, that you came back to life and that you sent your Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us, to give us the power to live because we don't always have it. We seldom have it on our own ability, in our own flesh. Thank you for what you have done, God, for us. Transform us from the inside out, from the outside in. Shape our thinking, shape our habits, shape our loves, shape our worship. Go with us this week. As we're in the different environments where our habits are not easily tuned towards you, God, would you give us the reminder of your presence there as well as you make us into the person you want us to be, which is Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.